Welcome to Attachment Theory in Action. Our podcast is dedicated to parents of children struggling with the effects of trauma and attachment disorders and the caseworkers, coordinators, and other professionals who support them. Today, your host, Karen Doyle Buckwalter, will introduce you to Dr. Jane Aronson, who is an adoptive mother, global pediatric specialist, founder of Worldwide Orphans, and the author of the book, Carried in Our Hearts, Creating Families Across Continents. So I am here today with Dr. Jane Aronson, who is also sometimes known as the orphan doctor. And um, Jane Aronson, I, I would like to give you an opportunity to just give a little bit of your background to people who might be listening. Um, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I've had a, an amazing pathway in my life and in that I've always been curious and love learning <clears throat> and very playful and physical as a person. And uh, I've had lots of really wonderful experiences growing up and learning, whether it was, you know, in my elementary or high school time or college, and then a medical school, teaching experience for 10 years, and then becoming a physician, which was my life stream, and, and then being able to uh, go from being a, a pediatrician specializing in HIV and infectious diseases to working in the field of adoption, where I learned so much about human nature and human behavior and met so many wonderful people and began to travel all over the world, and that experience was amazing. Um, the screen just turned, Karen. I think we're I think we're okay. Okay, um, I put, I pressed the little thing that says ignore. Anyway, so I've been very fortunate to have a lot of adventures and experiences with people, and I think that what I want people to know is that I'm a person who loves to know people, and, and I and I love children, and I want to know them very well, and I want people to know them well, and finally. <clears throat> what happened to me over time was that I was able to learn so much about children through my adoption practice that led me to then study and experience children in the world, all around the world, where I could perhaps help the most children uh, in my professional work and, and derive the most wonderful experiences, finally, as a parent, adopting two sons who are now 17 and 19, one from Vietnam and one from Ethiopia. And, uh, you know, I'm very eager always to be part of these kinds of learning experiences where I get to be interviewed by an interesting person like you yeah. and people who are motivated to help families yeah. uh, who uh, have used adoption as their way to create their families and are ever, you know, ever so eager to help optimize their children's growth and development so they can be successful in this very complicated world. Yes, yes, thank you. So you come by this both as a professional interest and a personal interest as an adoptive parent. And um, I think that um, as a clinician and a therapist working with families, I have found that there's always more to learn, um, especially about international adoption. Um, it's a very complex area. I think some people underestimate it. Um, but you have specialized in medical issues, um, international adoption medicine. So can you tell us a little bit about what that, what that means? Just define that for people in terms of how you, you're, you've been doing this work. Well, in fact, it's interesting that, you know, I was attracted to, and people were attracted to me regarding the infectious diseases and medical issues for children adopted from abroad. But finally, uh, within a short period of time, you know, even though obviously I had a lot of fun helping parents to uh, discover what infectious diseases children might have had or medical conditions, and then we could, uh, you know, we have resources here in the United States so that people could get access to helping their children overcome uh, medical and infectious disease issues. But that really wasn't the most important part of adoption. As it turned out, 
It was really about development, which really is the heart of pediatrics. As pediatricians, we're really about anticipatory guidance. We're about helping parents to understand where their children are developmentally, emotionally, psychologically, and to then uh, be able to provide children with a, a, a scaffolding, uh, a framework for them to feel safe and comfortable, whether they're adopted or not. So mm -hmm. for me, you know, it really became more about attachment and uh, all of the domains of development, fine motor, gross motor, personal, social, adaptive, connect, cognition, speech and language, which are things that I was just so attracted to as a school teacher um, and as a person, wanted to know myself with regard to those issues. So I think that what really finally happened was uh, I got drawn into a new and mysterious way of becoming a good physician and an advocate for families because the issues of adoption, both domestically and internationally, are really about uh, children's understanding of their identity, their persona as an adopted person, uh, layered over the fact that they're just children and right. kids growing to achieve developmental, developmental competency, if you will, particularly in the area of connection. So it was really that pathway that delighted me because then I could communicate with parents and help them to feel strong about their parenting. Very hard to feel strong about your parenting. And parenting, I think, is one of the most, if not the most challenging aspects of, it, of a human's life if they choose to be a parent. Um, it's not for wimps, as one of my parents once said to me. Hey, it was very funny. That's and great. I, and I, you're right, and that cute. And I, I have to say that now that I, you know, I've been a parent to two young boys who are 17 and 19, I feel like I'm more confused now than ever. Um, and I, I, um, I, I access lots of resources to help myself, whether it's you know personal, you know, friends, um, or it's. Um, therapists, social workers, psychologists. My best teachers have always been from the adoption community, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. So does that, is that a good answer? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I so, I mean, finally, the medical issues now are really interesting because in domestic adoption, you know, so I was, you know, international adoption was, of course, a, such a great interest to me because of the medical and infectious diseases, but... At the end of the day, domestic adoption was always interesting also because, you know, children are exposed to conditions in pregnancy and the genetic issues of being born to a birth mother who may have had lots of challenges, whether it's from an impoverished community, family, uh, mental health issues, underlying medical conditions, and then exposure to drugs and alcohol. Uh, so that's become very uh, powerful in my work currently because you know, most adoptions now are domestic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, there's been a lot of change in international adoption and reduction. Um, so just staying on the international adoption topic a little bit longer, something I heard you share previously was that um, you wanted people to know that adoption is not the big answer to the problem of orphans internationally and that we need to be looking at how to provide care in their home countries and thinking about some of this in a very different way and that really stuck with me. I'd like to hear you speak about that a little bit. Thanks Karen. <clears throat> this is a nice interview. I'm enjoying you. <laughs> so my book carried it in our hearts which I wrote a few years back, which includes essays written by parents who came to my practice, has a, a very nice chapter at the end. One of my favorite chapters, I think all the other chapters are just about the process, you know, the steps to before you adopt and preparing yourself for adoption and then the process and so forth. And then the essays uh, are the voices of parents who've experienced that process in a very tender and gentle way. So the book is sweet. But that last chapter that I write about, which is really about the geopolitical issues of children, hundreds of millions of children. There are 2.2 billion children in the world, but there are probably hundreds of millions of children who live without parental care and who need equity of 
in medical care and in psychosocial support in their own communities and they need the opportunity to experience the capacity of their own culture and communities so that they can grow up to be Ethiopian or Indian or Nepali. And those cultures are powerful elements in children's lives and it's important for children to be able to be cared for by the infrastructure, the governments. And you know, what happened in my time in adoption was you know, kind of sad in that you know, we invested a lot of energy and money in um, what we considered important for uh, safety and, and prevention of trafficking, <clears throat> which is certainly an important concern, but we invested in that on this side of the ocean and never really invested in the growth and development capacity building of the social worker infrastructure in sending countries where those individuals could benefit from understanding the very important dishes of orphan children living in institutions particularly. Mm -hmm. And we didn't invest that money in there. And then, you know, so we, we really missed the point. We focused on something that was really not the be all and end all of all of this. So I think that what I want to stress with people is that then what happened is I took in as a curious and adventurous learning professional that I could see there the children had issues. Orphans had issues when they arrived here. And I looked at those issues. And, you know, this is such a great moment for me. My, one, my so, one of my social workers who's the chief of program at, at the foundation, which, which I created in 1997, is 20 years old now. She went to all my volunteers who had gone to, you know, 15 countries. And they did these volunteer projects early on. You know, I mentored each one of the volunteers. We've had 500 family groups, you know, all kinds of teams of different individuals from different academic backgrounds, but mostly lots of caretaking and loving individuals, college students and graduate students who wanted to go and learn about orphans. And she took my journals just recently and she went into them and she's, you know, foraging for the data, huge amounts of data about children's heights and weights and head circumferences and developmental uh, status in orphan children in countries all over the world. Wow. And I mean, it's just, this is very exciting and very touching and loving. And, and just, you know, just the history of our organization is about that. It's about capturing what exists in the community and how children live and how they think and what adults think of children in those settings and how are adults brought up in those environments that are so impoverished and affected by conflict and war and disaster and disease and God knows what. So, um, you know, the beauty of what happened for me was to segue out of adoption, in a way I still do primers and pre-adoptions and domestic, international, but what I really wanted was to, to really delve into the needs of children who are in their own countries mm. and build an infrastructure there, capacity building. So we have staff who are so well trained. Uh, we're in Vietnam, Ethiopia, Bulgaria, um, um, uh, and, um, and Haiti, and now in the U.S., and we use a very beautiful intervention, the toy library and the element of play, to intervene in a way and understand children's development, but also to teach adults all about attachment and, and development and how to connect with children through language. Mm -hmm. Most adults never play in, a, in an impoverished environment. So mm -hmm. I've been really lucky to, to sort of follow the development of... of, of it's, it's, it's like... It's, it's like being a child, you know, you develop all your life. Mm -hmm. You and I are, are developing, you know, and, and you know, I, I, we go through these wonderful stages of becoming more interested in our world and we become generative. This all comes from Childhood and Society, written by uh, Dr. Eric Erickson, is one of my heroes in, 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 in scholar, scholarly, you know, work. And, and so... You know, I've been really fortunate to then take the lessons learned for families who were adopting and then apply it to these to children in their own communities and then to figure out programming in the community so that those adults and I could build some structure for them and they could have the competence and confidence that to discover how to take care of their own social welfare issues, if you will, yeah. long term. Yeah. Sorry, for, sorry for the long-winded answer. No, but I, I'm happy to hear you speak about it because 
honestly, a lot of people are not thinking this way um, that I had been exposed to. And that that is, you know, like I said, something that that stood out that you talked about when I when I first heard you. And it's so um, I mean, not only is it sustain capacity building and sustainable, it's just so much more honoring and respectful. You got it. And the key is that we focus on trauma. And you know how that is, because that's what your work is. Right. I, I read a little bit about Chaddock and <clears throat> that long, long list of all the different kinds of ways in which you can help people get the resources they need for kids who have uh, uh, trauma in their backgrounds and uh, behavioral issues. And so we're really trauma-informed in mm -hmm. all ways. We're focused on the trauma of, uh, of different, in different cultures and how to address that through play and education. And... Um, and we, we focus on, you know, a lot of the lessons learned about trauma in the U.S. Societal trauma comes from the adverse childhood experiences studies, which mm -hmm. were done at Kaiser Permanente in the mid-90s, thousands of questionnaires that reveal the epidemiology of health issues mm -hmm. uh, for our population and are very applicable. And there, you know, there are 50 plus academic peer-reviewed studies that reveal the long-term issues of people who have been exposed to early trauma in their lives and what happens to them when they're finally in their 30s and 40s and what our, what our society looks like right now. Um, so I did want to ask you if you could speak a little bit more about element of, of play. Sure. Um, so so that's, that's a trademark for our umbrella of, of services to children, which includes uh, play through toy library and sport and art and music and theater and dance. Um, and um, so you can imagine element of play. It's very cute. It's designed by a wonderful uh, business partner of mine, a Marvel citizen, Chad Hancock. And we spent a lot of time together. He builds businesses. He's in Minneapolis. And uh, he provided us with uh, brand architecture and, and branding. And now we're learning, we're really moving into co-branding with companies and trying to sell our product, which is Toy Library. And the element of play is, you know, like an element in, in, uh, in the periodic table, you know, pursue it to my interest in science. And it's as important as every element there, which might be oxygen and nitrogen and, uh, and Correct. all the other uh, elements that are so, uh, I think, unknown to most of us. But this element of play is, is an essential in life, especially for children but it's really a secret weapon for adults. So the toy library uses two parts here, developmental assessments, so we can use play through scientifically curated toys and other aspects, as I just mentioned, to be able to help children achieve their milestones. And then the adults, are able to really, really address the issues of communication with children. So there's millions of adults around the world, probably, probably when you think about the fact that there's 7 billion people on this planet, there could be like the vast majority of adults on this planet likely haven't played and don't know how to play and haven't given the opportunity to play really with their imagination mm -hmm. and their, the connection to another human being where there's listening and there's quiet and there's excitement, and there's jubilance, and then there's quiet, and there's discovery. And mm -hmm. this is like a, this is a workforce dream of mine that mm -hmm. we can teach adults early childhood development, and they can go off to become really great mentors to change their communities so that we're more respectful, as you mentioned, and kind to the culture of children. And I would like this to be kind of like a new form of education mm -hmm. where, it's, where it's not about books. It's about the feeling you get when you hear beautiful music. Like when I was in Temple the other night for Rosh Hashanah, the rabbi played an instrument called the oud, which is an ancient string instrument that was played by the Egyptians and then the Persians and it's gorgeous, and the music is minor and, and also major. But typically, the minor tones that's so viscerally stimulating and then causes us to 
feel calm and comfortable. And that's what toy library is with adults, you know, one adult to two children. And you can be in a room and the children are holding hands with one another and the adults and there's this, these moments of comfort and safety and opportunities to make noise mm -hmm. and, then, and then make art and mm -hmm. then run and exercise and play soccer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of the, all of the elements of play, but under the, the, the umbrella of element of play. That's wonderful. And, you know, movement and rhythm and eye contact and all of these things that we know um, form attachment and connection in the beginning. Um, and we continue to need it throughout our lifetime. Well, my final question for you, it might be a little bit of a loaded question, but so um, I have a particular interest also in attachment theory. And um, what would you want to say um, you can choose either from, from your perspective as a physician, a parent, adoptive parent, about attachment and attachment disorders. What's the message you want people to have about that? That's a great question. You're, you're terrific. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> have you had fun? This is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, attachment is, is, is so important. I mean, it's the basis of, of how I ended up with such passion for the work because I saw so many children with discomfort around attachment due to the lack of connection to the adults in their environment growing up, abandonment and then lack of touch and closeness and the kind of feeding behavior that's so important with eye contact and, and, uh, and that kind of holding that's so, so essential to a child feeling a sense of their physical being. So attachment is so powerful and um, and I feel like I don't, never was comfortable really talking about RAD and it as a disorder. Mm -hmm. I actually felt like it was a journey and that we're always attaching more and more as we grow, even as adults. And that we have to be accepting of where people arrive in that continuum of attachment, hopefully always enhancing and helping them to find the comfort they need, but not having, I think, a final judgment of how it should look. Hmm. That's refreshing. Yeah, yeah, I, I like, I like it, it. It comes also from my early experience as a teacher of autistic children. Mm-hmm. And I learned lots of great lessons there because lots of kids who were autistic really, you know, had such challenges with attachment. Mm -hmm. And I think the secret to their success was allowing them to attach in a way that was comfortable for them, even if it, might, even if it was calamitous for us as teachers <laughs> in the classroom. And it was. I was, a I was a crisis intervention teacher in a classroom for autistic and spectrum kids. But anyway, um, I learned a lot about how they saw attachment and what they needed. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for that. Um, so where can people find out more about you? I know you have multiple <coughs> websites. Your book, um, Carried in Our Hearts, is the best way to get that on Amazon. You know, I don't even know if it's available anymore. You know, I don't pay attention to it now because um, um, I'd like to write more, and it might be, but I haven't checked. I have a bunch of them in the office, but I, I think they're available somehow in libraries and so forth. But I think the important piece is that I have a website for people who are interested in pre-adoption mm -hmm. referral reviews, which I'm still, I am still love and adore. And mm -hmm. that's opendoctor.com. And then the, the, the most important thing is for them maybe to go to www.org, worldwideorphans.org because that's where they'll learn about what we do, what kind of programming we provide around the world and in the U.S. for children who are, you know, poverty-stricken and without an education and places where they might get interested in this work and see how to spread it. We want to scale and spread. We want it to be an infectious disease. <laughs> <laughs> toy library, toy library everywhere. We want it to catch on and be in every school and hospitals and shelters but libraries we think it's 
you know, like all the rage, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Well, what a great note to end on. Um, well, thank you so much. And um, I, I appreciate it. And I um, look forward to, to following um, on your Worldwide Orphans website. It's just so exciting what you're doing. And um, yes. Um, thanks so much. You're welcome, Karen. Thanks for the, uh, what a lovely, fun experience at the end of a long day. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Attachment Theory in Action. We hope you'll join us again as we continue to explore attachment theory. Please follow our site, traumaattachmentcenter.com, for future podcasts, blogs, and training opportunities.